the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating tonight? As you know, I believe that there's always something to celebrate if we take the time to do so. And there's a lot to celebrate. Today is National Fajita Day. I love fajitas, so that's something to celebrate. Today is also the anniversary of the first mail order catalog. I can't even get it out. Uh, So we celebrate that. But more importantly, we are celebrating a man who has changed or helped to change the landscape of American music, and we are all the better for it. I am so excited that Alan Paul is on the show tonight. When I think about this little boy growing up in Newark, New Jersey, going to Broadway at a very early age, doing early Broadway shows, going back to school, then going back to Broadway and introducing the song Beauty School Dropout, then doing, you know, introducing and bringing us Manhattan Transfer. Uh, That's our show for tonight. Everyone can go home now. Thank you. Bye. (laughs) Hello, Alan. Welcome to the show. Hello, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. I am so thrilled that you were here tonight. And before we begin, I begin every show. Who or what are you celebrating today? Uh, well, I'm celebrating life. Absolutely. You know, it's a, a gift, a blessing. It's so good to be alive. And, you know, that's what I celebrate every now, day. Uh, there is something that we were to talk about tonight. And there are everything must, all great things must come to a close or the beginning of a close. Uh, and you have a new CD coming out, Manhattan Transfer, uh, called 50, uh, and uh, which we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I have the cover of this. Uh, and here it is. What a gorgeous cover, first of all. And you, that's coming out uh, next month. And then you are going to embark on an American tour uh, to be followed by a European tour. And you are calling this your final tour. Why and why now? Uh, Well, I think that, um, you know, celebrating the 50th, uh, I think that, honestly, touring is getting more complicated in the world. And, um, you know, I love, I, I, I love performing. All of us love performing. We love to get in front of the audience and to give our music to them. Schlepping, that's another thing. <laughs> and the older like, you get, the harder the schlepping gets. You know, uh, and sometimes the, you know, flying and traveling gets really, really hard, you know. And we, we're, you know, we're not exactly spring chickens anymore. So we thought that, that this would be a good time, you know, to do this. Uh, uh, it's not to say that Manhattan Transfer will never perform again. It's just to say that in terms of touring, we're going to stop the touring for now. Well, I want to ask you, Alan, I mean, you've been, I mean, your career covers the gamut of so many different genres, Uh, but the business has changed so much. What are the things that you have absolutely embraced in terms of changes in the industry? And what are some of the things that you absolutely miss that were in place when Manhattan Transfer first got together and first began? Ah, well, that's a very good question. Um, definitely the uh, the industry has changed. Uh, the internet has brought a lot of uh, different uh, uh, possibilities in a way. The upside of it is that in the digital realm, um, editing and producing music 
uh, digitally is um, is easier, fun. It's uh, um, I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy producing and I enjoy doing it that way. I do miss analog. I do miss the analog days when you had pieces of tape that you would slice with the you know with a razor blade and then you'd stick it on the wall. So you'd wait till another point and then you'd slice again and stick it in and, and tape it together. Uh, you know, there was something that was so organic about that. And um, the way that analog sounded was so much warmer, so much richer. Uh, but now with broadband being wider, mm -hmm. they're able to actually replicate a lot of what those sounds were with analog. So. That's one thing. Uh, in terms of the business itself, it's a complete turnaround. You know, when uh, Napster hit, when MP3s came in, it totally devastated the music industry in a sense, because the old paradigm of the way that that record companies worked. Uh, well, you look at as at a CD when CDs first came out, you were paying twenty one, twenty two dollars for a CD you know, because it was so new. But then once it, it you know, they started mass producing everything, uh, the cost of making a CD shrunk. It was very, very little. And yet the record companies kept it the same price. And so that's really how, how Napster and MP3 kind of came in and it changed the whole industry in terms of the way that people listen to, to music. Um, and, and so there's only a few major labels um, that do it. But the way that they approach artists today, it's more of like a, 300, a 360 deal. So it's a package where everybody, an artist has to have a great fan base um, and uh, management in place and touring in place and everything else. And then the, the record company comes in and then that's how they work. Manhattan Transfer, we're, we're very fortunate because, you know, we're, uh, we're a legacy group. Um, we're with uh, Concord Records, Craft Music, uh, uh, and uh, they're fabulous. They have been so great. Um, uh, that's enough. Let's, we'll talk about something else. That's, that's nice to hear that. Um, I want to ask you, uh, First of all, as a child, I've got photographs that I'm going to show in a moment. I normally ask my guests to show photographs of them as a five-year-old uh, because that's an early age in which you begin to shape yourself. But I want to ask you a different question. Um, the household that you lived in, uh, I know your brother, Jerry, very well. Yes. Um, and he also is a singer. Uh, did you grow up in a musical household? We did. We did. My mother was a singer, not a professional singer, but she was a singer. Um, and she sang uh, with the Yiddish theater. So, ah, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that photograph. Uh, yes. Um, and my grandfather was a cantor. Uh, so absolutely through that lineage, there was singing and music in our house always. And yes. what was the music that you were listening to mostly? Um, I know that you went to Broadway at a very early age. And how did that happen? Uh, I mean, were you taking lessons at an early age? Obviously, you were singing uh, professionally, I'm assuming. Uh, it, it, how did those opportunities come about for you? Um, well, it started, I was, I was studying with a man named Charlie Lowe. Uncle Charlie, as he was known by the kids. Uh, Charlie uh, had a studio in, in New York at 1650 Broadway in the basement. That is now the kitchen of a restaurant. But back then it was the studio. And he, uh, in the studio, they taught uh, tap dancing. And, uh, and you would take a private singing lesson with Charlie that was called the personality lesson. And uh, so I got a lot of uh, a lot of my roots, a lot of my grounding, starting with with, with Charlie. Okay, mm -hmm. and in the summertime, he would take fourteen kids, 
I was included in, in that. And we go up to the Catskill Mountains and we, you know, put a show together. It was all vaudeville music. That was my beginnings in a sense. It was all vaudeville. I had no idea at the time what it meant, but it was beginnings of American popular music. Eva Tangway, Russ Colombo, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, all of these people that were stars at that time, because Charlie was an old vaudevillian. That's where he came out of. And um, so that's what we learned. And he was he was kind of Fagan. Mm -hmm. He was Fagan to, to us kids. So he, we, we do the routine and he'd come out and he said, you know, and let's bring out Al Jolson. I always did Al Jolson, you know, or Eva Tangway or whatever. And that was the reason we go to all the different hotels and we play. And it was great experience, you know, just getting those roots. And it was from there that I went to uh, audition for Oliver. Because that well, was kind before of we get, Before we get there, um, the fact that you were singing with these kids and doing this, I mean, for a lot of kids at that age, it becomes just, uh, well, not just a hobby, but for some it's a hobby. Um, others really get that bug and this is something they pursue. You mentioned earlier that desire to be in front of an audience. Um, what is it that drew you in? For some, it's fame. Uh, for some, it's that applause that's coming across the footlights. What was it that first pulled you into this business? Money. <laughs> I like story, it. it came from my brother, Jerry. Okay. My brother, for one, one he, he was singing in some choir. And he came home. Yeah, he was about, I don't know, 12 or something like that. And he came home. He's three years older than I am. And he had 10 bucks. And I said, where'd you get 10 bucks? He said, I got it singing. I said, they paid you to sing? He said, yeah. He said, I'm going to be a singer. So it was, it was kind of like that in a joking way. But I always sang. I just loved to sing. It was something that I really did well. I didn't know that until people started coming around and saying, yeah, you know, you really do. And I started getting a lot of support. You know, I belong to uh, a boys club. It was the South Ward Boys Club in Newark. My brother and I joined. We were actually the first members, one of, I don't know, 12 kids or something that were going around with a can to raise money to buy a movie theater so we could turn it into a boys club. And they were very supportive of me, you know. Um, I got a scholarship for music through that boys club uh, that actually put me all the way through college. Um, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I had learning difficulties. Mm. I was, a, I was a, a square in a round hole. And uh, I just could not, I didn't do very well in school. You know, I was uh, hyper dyslexic, all that kind of stuff. And I, I, you know, but the one thing that I could really do well was sing. So I think that I just kind of pursued that because it, it, it brought joy to me, you know. Now, did Charlie Lowe uh, find opportunities for you or how did you hear about the auditions for Oliver? Well, that was separate. Um, with, with Charlie, you know, I mean, some of the people that came out of Charlie were Elliot Gould, mm. Um, let's see who else, uh, Christopher Walken. They were all students of Charlie. They were, they were older than me. Uh, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people and the, the, you know, television shows and stuff like that, variety shows that were hiring kids. They were hiring them from Charlie's group because they were so well polished and they could dance and everything else. So, so that's where they were going. Um, it seemed to be the next step. I did a couple of summers with Charlie, you know, doing the Catskills and stuff, but the, the goal, the aim was, a, was for Broadway, you know, that seemed to be the stepping stone, you know? And I, um, I met an agent. I was introduced to an agent. His name was Charlie Ryan and Charlie um, you know, he, he was a booking agent primarily for variety. He, he really didn't do a lot of television and stuff like that. 
but he uh, he said there's an open call for this this show Oliver that was that was showing in, uh, there, and so I got got you to do an open call, and I remember uh, I. I mean, I was I was green. <laughs> My ears were green. I didn't really know too much about about that stuff, you know. And I remember uh, standing. It was an open call, and there were like I don't know, over five hundred kids or something in the alleyway, you know. And I went in and um, and I sang. Uh, uh, Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning, because I knew the soft shoe to it. Because you had a sing and dance. So I did that. I got a call back. So the next time they said, well, you know, we want you to do consider yourself and, and something else. And then uh, it's just so crazy how the business is and you just never know. And then there's always the element of grace that just happens when you don't expect it. And it just kind of unfolds and happens. And it just falls into your lap or it seems to fall into your lap. It, um, it, was it an easy transition going into a Broadway show at that age for you? Uh, because there's an entire discipline that goes with it uh, of doing the eight shows a week, having to be there at the theater. How did that change your life and your family life? Uh, it made my life better in, in, a, in a lot of ways. We, we did a, a six-month pre-Broadway run. Uh, David Merrick was was our producer. Um, so we went to uh, Los Angeles and played at uh, Convention Hall, and then we played in San Francisco, and then we went to uh, Detroit, and then Toronto, and then we came to to Broadway. And uh, my mother came out because I was a minor, and she was totally elated to be out. You know, just to be out on the road. I was so glad to be out of school. You know, we had private tutor when we were on the road and stuff like that. And it just so much. It was just so much easier. I was doing what I loved, um, and I was very disciplined, very, very disciplined. I wanted this to happen. So, um, you know, uh, how long did you stay with the show? I was with the show uh, eight months because I was growing. I was one of the older kids. So um, the rule was, OK, when you hit five feet, we got to let you go. So um, I got to Broadway and and um, and then I just outgrew it. So I, they had to let me go. But um, but I now, got when you did The King and I, did you do The King and I? Was that on Broadway or did you do that on the road? <laughs> It was uh, it was summer stock. I did a couple of summer stocks of that. Uh, that was right after Oliver, and I did uh, the Paper Mill Playhouse with Betsy Palmer. Ah, uh, Betsy Palmer was a dear, dear friend of mine. Yes, with Betsy, um, and um, uh, and then I did one with Patricia Morrison. And that was quite her thing. She was delightful. I, I knew her, you know, from her old films and stuff like that. And she was absolutely delightful. Both of them were. I interviewed her on her 100th birthday and she was sharp as a tack. Just uh, incredible. Uh, so you continued to do theater, but then you decided to go to college. And yeah. So why that decision to leave the business for a while to go to college? That's something that very few in the business decide to do. Well, you know, um, I was doing well as an actor. I was doing uh, commercials. I was doing some TV, some film stuff and everything else. But my music was more important. And I that's what I really wanted to pursue. And I wanted to learn more because I had been doing nightclub work, um, you know, when I was in high school and stuff. Um, and um, I wanted to expand my, my education, you know. Uh, so I went into uh, what's Kane University now. It was Newark State College at the time. And they had a brand new curriculum for music. And so I went in as a vocal major and it was all classical. You know, they, it was a, a classical um, um, uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was 
amazing training. It was great training because, you know, after my voice had changed, you know, I was always a natural singer. I just sort of opened up my mouth and I would sing. And um, but when my voice changed, my mechanism changed, my instrument changed and I was starting to hurt myself. And I saw a couple of teachers, you know, in New York, whatever, and they said, OK, listen, if you continue singing the way that you are, the, the way you're doing, by the time you're you're 25, you're not going to have any voice left. It's going to be shot, you know. So I had to relearn how to sing, basically. And the teacher, um, um, Anna Jean Brown, that I that I was studying with at at uh, at Kane, uh, she said to me, "Okay, you got to give me a year. That means nothing. You can't do any singing outside." And I would say, "But I got some gigs." She said, "Nothing. You can't. You can't sing at all." And it was really, really difficult. I thought that I had lost my voice. I thought, I mean, I thought I sounded really bad and I couldn't well, quite. Well, you bring up an interesting point that I do want to talk about um, because with every singer, male and female, uh, the body changes and the voice changes as you yeah. get older. And some singers ignore those changes. Um, God bless the right teachers that came along who helped you along the way. What was that doing to you psychologically? I mean, obviously that fear that you're going to lose your voice, uh, which is your bread and butter also. Um, but what is that doing for you psychologically at this point in your life? Um, uh, psychologically, it was, it was kind of messing me up because I really thought that I had lost my voice. I thought that what I had as a child was gone and that I'd never be able to sing again. Mm. And then uh, I had to learn how to breathe. I had to learn about placement. I had to learn the whole uh, proper um, technique of being able to, to sing and not push myself and get hurt. Um, and so after four years of doing that, my, I had built up my, my body, my breathing, my um, vocal cords and everything to the point that uh, from that, basically from that point on, any singing that I did, I was able to not hurt myself. Now, was there a period of time where you were not pursuing work professionally because of this change? I knew you were doing commercials and doing other acting work, uh, but as far as the singing was concerned, did you completely stop pursuing that type of work for the time being? And yes. if so, how long did that period last? It lasted until my junior year. And then in my junior year, um, I went back to the Catskills. And I got a job as a uh, um, entertainment director mm -hmm. at a hotel at a kind of a, it, it wasn't exactly the Concord. It was a family hotel. And I was kind of the uh, entertainment director slash singer MC. So um, I started doing that, and my deal was, okay, I, do, I work at the hotel, but on the weekends, I can go out and sing at other hotels. And so that's what I, that's what I did, and, uh, and it was fine. It actually sustained me. I was uh, able to make enough money doing that to support myself. Right, and at this point, did you really have a game plan as to what the direction would be that would, your career path would be? Absolutely. Because I got my BA in, in music education and my my teachers were trying to encourage me to be a teacher. I mean, I did my student teaching and everything else, but I knew as soon as I graduated, I was going to be the horse at the gate. I was ready to jump in and, and pursue my career again. Absolutely. I, I wasn't really as much as I love teaching, you know, and I do that. Um, I wanted my career. I wanted to get back to that. And did that happen instantaneously? Because I know about your next big break, which we're going to get to in a moment. Uh, yes, because um, I, uh, one of my, uh, after Oliver, okay, wanting to expand my career into do, being an actor and being in television and 
movies and stuff like that and do commercials. The agent that I had, Charlie Ryan, who I'd love to get back to later, mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't do that for me. So I went with uh, another manager who, you know, uh, did that, who's worked with kids and stuff like that. And then I was going to professional school in New York because I couldn't go to private school. Uh, I mean, I couldn't go to a public school because they don't allow you to go out and, and, and do a, you know, if you have an audition. So you go to professional school in, uh, in New York. So if you get a call or something, it's understood. You, go out, you, you just go out and you do your auditions and stuff like that. Um, so it, when I graduated from college, I got back in touch with that manager uh, her name was Lily Spencer, mm -hmm. mother of John Spencer, the actor. Mm -hmm. uh, and she started sending me up for stuff. And then she gave, called me one day. She said, I got an audition for you for this off-Broadway show. And she said, it's called Grease. And I went, hmm. I said, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, I said, is that kind of a musical like Zorba the Greek? Because that had been very popular. And she said, no, 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 it's some kind of a... Different type of Greece. <laughs> some kind of, of a 50s thing, a 50s show. I said, okay. She said, do you do, do any 50s songs? I said, yeah, I, I do some 50s songs. So that's what I did. I went in and sang uh, Only You. I had long, big hair, and so I put it in a ponytail, and I went in, and it was on a Friday, and I remember everybody was there, you know, uh, Jim Jacobs was there, uh, Ken Waisman was there, uh, Tom Moore was there, uh, everybody was there that, that meant anything that were important, okay, so I did that, and then I um, left, I, and well, prior to that, I auditioned for, uh, and this is a, a, an interesting story for all of you out there that get discouraged, because I auditioned for Jesus Christ Superstar prior to that. I had 13 callbacks, 13. They called me back. Midway, they fired the director and then hired Tom O'Horton. Tom O'Horton had done hair. And so he, you know, so I went through the whole process again of auditioning, but then he wound up hiring everybody that was in hair. So I didn't get anything. And I was so discouraged. I just was like, oh, I don't know what to do. Maybe I should become a teacher. You know, this, I, I don't know. And that's when this whole Greece thing happened. I auditioned on a Friday. They called me that night and said, okay, you're starting on Monday. Okay. And that was it. And the trajectory of that show has been absolutely unbelievable. And of course, I'm going to put it out there. Uh, there's a great new book out. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tom Moore. Uh, tell me more. Tell me more. Tom Moore. Uh, and uh, get the book. Uh, I've done shows on the book. And, uh, uh, and of course, you are very featured in the book as well as you should be because you're very much a part of this history. Um, are you surprised? this many years later at the success of this show? Or did yes. You yes. I don't think anybody ever expected that, you know. Um, um, uh, I remember, well, and as Tom had mentioned to you on, on, you know, when you did the interview, I mean, we didn't know, we didn't know what we were gonna do. The, 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 a, a lot of the, uh, the critics did not like the show, did not know whether or not, we didn't have any money, didn't know what we were going to do. And then, uh, as it turns out, they made the gamble to bring it up to Broadway, you know. Um, and, uh, and then it just was selling out. It hit a nerve with people, you know. And, um, and then it took off from there. Then it had its uh, road companies and everything. And then, of course... There was the movie. There was the movie, the film. There is a movie on, of Greece. Uh, I think there was. I'm joking. <laughs> I know you are, and I'm joking with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, God bless Olivia Newton-John. You know, you know? Olivia Newton-John, who oh, it's such a you know. Wow. 
what a, what a, what a what an uh, angel. She truly was an angel. She was an angel, and and you know she put up such an amazing fight, and she was such an inspiration to so many people. You know, God bless her. But uh, that that really kind of turned the whole thing over again, and then every new generation we're doing Greece. It's amazing. And it just doesn't go away. It hasn't, it hasn't gone away. I mean, yeah, there are productions being done all the time around the world. You know? So your career could have gone down a specific path, you know, of Broadway, theater, everything. And uh, you are a phenomenal jazz singer. Uh, you are an amazing solo artist. There are many great solo albums that you have as well. Um, and uh, I think at last count, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, eight <laughs> Grammy Awards? Well, I, I won eight. Um, uh, the group won 10. And that's all kind of inclusive. Yes. We all get them, you know. But, right. but who's counting? <laughs> and uh, but when, how did that change or that, change happen in your career what was the spark that sent you in a different direction obviously that work in the catskills had to have had a huge impact on nightclub work and going in that direction for you well it brought i had a i had a particular skill in terms of being able to do that you know um it gave me a, uh, you know, be doing nightclub work like that. It gives you a sensibility about people. You read them. You read the audience immediately. Okay, let's change this song. You know, in the middle of the set, you I would sense, you know, okay, we got to do a different song. We got to do, you know, so it's like feeling it and flowing it because it's my responsibility. I always feel it's the performer's responsibility to win the audience over. It's our job, you know? Um, and some audiences are not always open, you know? Um, but uh, to answer your question, how the shift happened. So I was in, in Greece for about a year and a half already. We had gone from the Eden Theater up to the Royale, uh, up to the Broadhurst and then to the Royale. And I was doing some, uh, you know, some commercials and stuff like that. But there was something inside of me, you know, I was missing my music, mm -hmm. missing that, you know, not being able to do that. And um, so Laurel Massé, who's one of the original members of the group, uh, she was dating Roy Markowitz, who was the drummer in Greece. So I'd see her backstage all the time, you know, and she'd come and hang out and everything else. And um, the band, the guys in, in the in the Grease band, after after the show, uh, occasionally they would go and do a gig. You know, uh, Johnny Miller, who is one of the top uh, contractors for Broadway. OK, he was in that band and uh, he was also a songwriter. So they were looking to get a deal. They put the name, the name of their group, they, they said was Trust Me. Like uh, the, the famous last words of, 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 uh, of an agent or a manager, not to say that they're all, you know, uh, you go to them and they say, uh, hey, what's going on with this? He said, it's all working out. Trust me. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't work out. So anyway, they called it Trust famous Me. Famous last words in this business. <laughs> so uh, they were doing a gig at um, Kenny's Castaways. So I went down to see the guys and singing background in the group were Laurel, Janice Siegel, and this other girl. And I'm sitting there, I went, wow, she, I said, Laurel can really sing. I said, that's great. She had this like pure, gorgeous soprano, mm -hmm. you know? um, perfect pitch, you know? Um, and then Janice did a solo she did Aretha Franklin's Dr. Feelgood. Oh. And I'm looking at her, and here is this 19-year-old chick from Brooklyn <laughs> singing this. And uh, I went, that's absolutely amazing. She floored me, you know. Um, and then about 
Two weeks after that, Laurel approaches me and she says, you know that girl, Janice? I said, yeah, she's great. I said, yeah, I had to leave afterwards. I really wanted to meet her. She said, well, she and I and this other guy are putting a group together and we're looking for a fourth singer. And somebody recommended you and uh, wanted to know if you were interested. The last thing on my mind, honestly, was to join a group. I had never been in a group before. I was always a solo artist. Mm, well, I said, I'd like to meet Janice. So I said, okay, well, let me go. I'll, I'll come down. I'll hang out. So we went down to Tim's apartment. He lived on 4th Street in, in the uh, West Village and uh, went up to his apartment. And there was no furniture. It was wall to wall crates of records. 78s, 45s, uh, LPs, everything. I went, wow, well, that's impressive. I mean, it was a lot. And then he walks out of the room. And here is this guy, long hair, balding, and uh, with a beard and a mustache. And I'm waiting for the guy to come out. And it's Tim. So uh, I went, okay. I said, well, there must be something about him if the girls really think that he's something. So we sat and we talked. We talked about two hours. We talked about music. I always loved, loved swing music. And I always loved vocal groups, that sound. When I would hear a vocal group, I would literally stop in my tracks to listen to the harmony. You know, um, so we talked about it. We talked about what was going on. 1972, Vietnam was over. The clubs in New York, the uh, folk clubs, you know, uh, were changing into cabarets. It was the beginning of glitter rock. There was all this stuff that was going on. And this concept of doing four part harmony like the big band groups. But uh, uh, applying it to contemporary records fascinated me. I said, wow, that's really, that's really amazing. And Tim had experience. He, he had experience uh, as a record producer already, you know, which I really didn't have. And I went, okay, wow, wow, okay. <laughs> that was it. And so we started rehearsing and, um, you know, we, I could go on and on and on, but why don't you this ask? This is all amazing to me. Uh, I, it's just so fascinating. Where was your first performance? At Dr. Generosity's on 2nd Avenue and 82nd Street with sawdust on the floor. It was a bar. <laughs> sawdust on the floor. And we, uh, some friends of ours had a band, and so they had a gig there. And so we... Um, uh, so we sat in, we had, uh, you know, after rehearsing for six months straight, just to get our sound, just to get ourselves together that way, um, we then went and did our five songs. But there was another element to this because we said, listen, we can't go out in jeans. You know, we can't go out looking like, uh, you know, like a folk singer. I said, we got to somehow visually interpret what we're doing. So Tim's sister, Fayette Hauser, was one of the original members of the Coquettes. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Oh, not. yes. Very familiar with them. Yes. For those that are not, the Coquettes came out of San Francisco. Yes. They were a avant-garde street um, group performance uh, group that were primarily made up of transvestites. Mm -hmm. Over the top. And their shows were loose and wild and crazy. Yeah. And so they came I to will tell the everybody there's a great documentary about the Coquettes. Uh, and I think it's available on Amazon or Netflix. Check them out. Just Google them. Look them up. Uh, it'll give you a sense of what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the Cockettes came to New York and they tried to do what they did in San Francisco. But uh, the Broadway audience, they didn't exactly embrace them, you know, but they were there and Faye was there. So when it came time for us to get dressed and, and, and get 
clothes and stuff, she dressed us. And she dressed us like we were cockettes. So the girls had, um, everything was outrageous, you know. Janice wore a, a, a blonde Venus wig and, and we'd come out with uh, uh, toy dolls around our neck and uh, uh, um, peacock feathers for for eyes. You know, it was kind of like uh, with uh, with Divine, um, you know, and, and the whole group out of, out of uh, uh, Baltimore. We, we were all friends. They, we all hung out together. Um, the difference with us and the difference between us and, say, the New York Dolls um, were our music. It was different. So we looked similar. But when we opened up our mouths, there was something else that was going on. So that's where, how it how it started. Dr. Well, that first night that you did that first, uh, this is all incredible to me. That first night that you did that first performance, was it a soft opening or did you invite a lot of friends? Uh, uh, did you like slide under the radar? How did you begin to get that audience? Uh, because you your following uh, developed almost a cult status from the very beginning. Yeah, well, we didn't invite a whole lot of friends because I think it probably uh, sat about maybe 40 people, maybe not even that. I mean, it was a small bar, you know, was, and um, but what we did from that point on, we continued rehearsing every single day and we kept adding songs until we had 12. And once we had 12, then we were able to do our own set, our own show. So we started, uh, you know, playing at, at places like uh, um, Trudy Heller's and Reno Sweeney's, mm -hmm. you know, Max's Kansas City, places like that. And words started traveling around about us, you know, the uh, uh, about our music and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of how it started to expand, you know, Diana Vreeland would come down and look at us and, you know, she loved what we were wearing because it was so crazy and outrageous, you know, um, being the editor of Vogue, I mean, that yes. meant, meant a lot. And, uh, you know, the Stones would come and see us, you know, um, and like, there were two different audiences. There was like a new audience that weren't exposed to this music at all. They didn't understand it at all. And then we had um, celebrities, people that had actually grown up with that music, you know, Helen Forrest, Rex Harrison, all of these people that were coming because to them, oh, it was so refreshing to finally, to finally hear that. And you I know? love the fact that this was all happening, folks, in a day where we didn't have this, we didn't have the internet, you know, so it's all word of mouth and it's getting the word out there. Did you get an agent or a manager that was managing this group right away or how is it all beginning to unfold? Yes. So we set certain parameters for ourselves. One of the first ones was we got to get a manager. We have to get somebody who um, will be able to go in front of us and pitch us and talk. So we had a friend of ours, Sid Asale was his name. He had a, a restaurant uh, up on uh, First Avenue near 90th, I think. It was called Friends. And Friends was kind of a music industry hang. So we had a lot of people that, that were in the business that would come there and hang. And, and, and Sid was a schmoozer. So he was great. He was great at schmoozing everybody and talking like that. But he did not have, from a legal standpoint or anything, he didn't have any of that experience. There was another guy um, um, that came in, and he was a lawyer, okay? Peter Frank was his name. And he was a lawyer, but he wasn't an entertainment lawyer. He was just a lawyer, and he loved the group. He believed in the group. Um, so they became our managers and they managed us for about two and a half years. And their job was to get us a record deal. And 
we had, you know, they brought in from every single company, people came to see us and nobody would pick us up. You know, a lot of middle management guys and, um, you know, <laughs> they are, they guys, you know, which is all cool and well, but, you know, they always said, well, I don't, I don't know what to do with them. They're not commercial because we're not like anybody else. So I don't want to take the risk signing them, not in, having it not happen and then getting fired. So they just wouldn't do it. And that's kind of where uh, uh, where Aaron Russo came in. OK, so Bette Midler was a good friend of ours. OK, Bette was doing the baths at the time and she was signed to Atlantic and her manager was Aaron Russo. So we ran into Bette and Aaron one night at this bar. It was called. Uh, 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 doesn't matter. It, it was uh, it, it was. Um, and those people that are out there that are listening to this that know that, forgive me, sorry about that, um, and it'll come to me. But anyway, he was there, and 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 they said, so how are things going, you know? And we had already at this time said, listen, we got to make some change. You know, we have to figure something out because we're doing everything that we could possibly do. You know, we're selling out and everything else. We're getting great press, but we can't get a deal. So Aaron said, well... Um, and we had made a demo and everything. And, and he said, well, if there's anything that I can do for you, let me know. And the next day we were <laughs> on the phone saying, help, we need your help. So uh, he said, okay. And we worked out a deal with, with our other managers and stuff like that. And then Aaron took over. And then a week after that or so, we were playing at the Bijou Cafe in Philly. And Aaron calls us and said, he, uh, Martin Mull, was opening for us and he says okay hold the show i'm bringing somebody down okay so we're holding a show we're telling martin to extend <laughs> keep doing it you know and then finally he arrives we do our show and after the show he comes up and he brings ahmed erdogan and ahmed was the the founder and head of atlantic records and um, Ahmed got it. He understood exactly what we were doing, you know, the music. I mean, I think it, it, it ap uh, appealed to his musical sensibility personally, you know, irregardless of whatever, what Atlantic did and sold and, and everything else. You know, he just loved what we were doing and stuff, you know. So in the vernacular of Ahmed Aird again, he said, I love you guys. You guys are great. I'd love to have you on my label. That's great. I have a question um, from Diamond S Music. Uh, what were some of the songs in that original 12 repertoire? In the original repertoire? Yes. Okay. We had uh, That Cat Is High. We had uh, Use a Viper. We had um, House of Blue Lights. We had I Want You to Be My Baby. We had Guided Missiles. Uh, we had uh, You Can Depend on Me. We had, um, uh, what else? Uh, Candy came in. We had Operator. Uh, um, and so on and so forth. And we, uh, I think eventually we added uh, Give Me Some Skin. That came from the Andrew sisters and so on and so forth. Like that. Well, I'm going to give away. Uh, when is the uh, new CD 50 coming out? The new CD gets released October. I hope I'm right. October 2nd, I believe. Tomorrow, we're actually, uh, uh, Concord is releasing uh, our second single, which is The Man I Love. So that comes out tomorrow. The uh, God Only Knows was our first single that came out a couple of weeks ago. So then uh, The Man I Love comes out tomorrow. Well, when the CD comes out, I'm going to give it away to a lucky winner tonight. All you need to do is respond with hashtag good humor because it's good humor that gets us through all of this. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, 
about the good humor that's gotten you through all of this, your entire trajectory of your career? Well, I think to start off, there was the good humor man. <laughs> because I loved his ice cream, especially the coconut. Me too. Me too. <laughs> the, 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 the roasted coconut ice pop. That was that was me. No, but seriously speaking, I, I think the humor, you know, uh, it's always trying to find it, that joy, that spark, that thing, because sometimes it's really difficult. It's hard. I mean, especially through the times that are difficult and how people are pulled down by things. It's just so, so hard, you know, and I understand that. Um, so it's just trying to find that that joy, that that grace. It's like doing what, you know, I love movies myself. I am a idiot. I, I, I grew up ever since I was born in front of a TV. The TV was my babysitter. So I grew up watch, watching all of that. And I, I and I, you know, just had such a uh, love and admiration for film. I have a two-part question. Uh, out of everything that you've recorded, and this is probably a difficult question, but do you, is there one particular song that is a favorite of yours? Mm, well, um, oh, it's a, it is a loaded question, Richard. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I love, you know, I love Twilight Zone, Twilight Tone. Oh, yes. Because, uh, you know, uh, not just because I, I wrote it, uh, co-wrote it with Jay Graydon. Um, um, be I was always a Twilight Zone fan and, uh, you know. Did that just come to you? And it, it, what was the inspiration for that one night? What was it? You, were you watching a particular episode of the Twilight Zone? No. <laughs> The the way that it worked is it actually early on we used to do funny things in the, in in the show, you know. Uh, I I used to do an imitation of Jim Amici. That's Don's brother, selling a clock. <laughs> if you remember that as well, and I also did a uh, an imitation of of Rod Serling pointing out the fact that Rod had no upper lip like that. And he had one eyebrow and he was very serious and did this stuff. But I was always, you know, uh, aware of the fact that the Twilight Zone theme had become something more than just a theme. It had become a part of our society. Whereas if something weird or... Um, perhaps supernatural or something like that would occur, the retort that people would come up with would be, -na 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 they come up with that little guitar thing. Mm -hmm. So when we got together uh, with Jay Graydon, our producer, um, I went to the group and I just had this idea. I said, what about if we do a vocal interpretation of the Twilight Zone theme? And there was a pause. And uh, they went, okay. So Jay was a being being a phenomenal guitarist, you know, being actually the the number one A choice for studio work in Los Angeles. He would always play the Twilight Zone, ching, 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 that. So we that's how it came up. We decided we, we, we were going to write a, a, a disco version of the Twilight Zone theme. Wow. So when is the tour going to start? And do you have New York dates yet? I want to put it on uh, my calendar. The New York dates are not set yet. They will probably happen, um, I would think, next year because we're, we're doing some other touring. And really the... Um, uh, the celebration really goes all the way into next year. You know, um, the group started in October of 72. So that's like really the, you know, so 73 is really kind of the beginning. So it will absolutely get, we're going to be playing there. 
Um, well, I definitely want to doing dates that. now. I mean, we're uh, uh, September 7th. We're playing the Hollywood Bowl. Um, um, Winton Marsalis and the uh, Lincoln Center Big Band is also on the bill. So that should be an exciting night. And we're, and, uh, we're going to be doing, uh, starting our 50th anniversary tour um, with uh, probably in October, September, October. And then we're going over to Europe. We're going to Finland and, um, and to Sweden and perform over there. Well, this is great. I don't want the show to end. Uh, and I just want to, I, I want to give an open invitation. And I know that everyone who's watching right now is going to scream when I say this. I want to, I want to do an evening with the entire Manhattan transfer right here on the show. So All right. let's make it happen. Richard, I have connections. <laughs> I want to have you on. I just here. might be able to make that happen. Yeah. I am such a fan. And this, uh, and I want to say to Jerry, Jerry, thank you, thank you, thank you. Tom Moore, uh, Judy Chorsky, all of you, all of those angels who transpired to make this happen tonight. So thank you. And uh, don't go anywhere for a moment uh, because I'm going to bring this on the screen and we're going to give uh, a copy of 50 away. Uh, remember, you're going to have to wait for it. Uh, but tomorrow, another track is going to drop. So Brad. Brad, 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 please send me uh, your contact information so I can get this uh, to you. Um, and uh, I'm going to remove this. That would mean a lot to me. Uh, so before you go anywhere, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I don't take it lightly uh, that you could have been anywhere else tonight and you chose to be here in the Twilight Zone with Alan and me. So thank you so much. I, I mean, I, you've got to write a book. Is that? Well, I'm I'm actually writing a memoir. I'm like halfway through. Um, I am, and uh, yeah. Yes, and, you, know, you know you've got to. And uh, anything that I can do to help you guys in any way, not that I can do that much, but I'm there in your corner always. So I uh, just nice. I'm just such a fan. And uh, everyone, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, after tonight's show, if you don't mind, please go back to YouTube, leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, with your thoughts about tonight's show. Please share this with your friends. Get the word out. Uh, and let's uh, make this uh, 50 go gold and beyond. Uh, so uh, it's it's got to happen. Um, I also end every show. Uh, but before I, this, it's good humor. Uh, not just the ice cream, which is also very good. Do you know the theme? Do you want to? Play it. I'm a friendly man who sells good humor. The ice cream kids all favor. That's not. Oh, good. I didn't know that. So, mm -hmm. but everyone, uh, find the good humor in everything that you do, the people that you meet, uh, everything. You see something on the news, try to find the humor in it because otherwise it's going to weigh you down and we're weighed down enough as it is with monkey pox and polio and everything else popping up everywhere. Uh, if you're getting down, my advice to you is to put on Manhattan Transfer and it will lift you up. It does for me. I've been listening to it all day long today. Um, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the fifth name that pops up and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. As my dear friend Sean Moniker always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So, Alan, I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything you want to say about anything that we talked about tonight that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now, I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you will continue to give. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it's all that. yours. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, what do I have to say? Well, I think Richard said everything. You know, uh, harmony has a lot of a lot of power. You know, within us, it's a it's a vibration. You know, um, and it's everywhere, and it's trying to find that. You know, and share that. You know, it's it's real important. You know, so like Richard said, if there are people that you love and that you care about, reach out to them. You know, um, and keep the cycle going. Okay. It's been a pleasure being here, everybody.